The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, as Majority Leader, there has been no benefit of this job that I've appreciated, very frankly, more than my magic one minute. I intend to take it now. My friends on both sides of the aisle may be glad to know that this is the last time, perhaps, that I'll be able to avail myself of that privilege. I intend to use this extended minute to reflect on what we've achieved together during recent years and on a principle that I'm eager for us to continue to apply in the years ahead. As Democratic Caucus Vice Chairman and Chairman, as Co-Chair of the Democratic Steering Committee, as Democratic Whip, and as Majority Leader, I approach my work and leadership with one principle in mind, the psychology of consensus. What is this psychology of consensus? It means having a greater sense of us being in this work together than apart. It means waking up and saying, I'm on the team, the American team, privileged as, privileged as citizens to serve in this body on behalf of all our fellow citizens. It means setting out with the intention to make progress, not to block it. And it means focusing on what unites us as Americans. Democrats have put the, this ethos into practice to hold the party line when we needed every vote on nearly every vote. Our members remind one another, consider how we can better be with us before deciding whether to have to vote the other way. Let me share some examples of this success. In 2008, President Bush asked us to take emergency action to prevent a financial catastrophe. He was joined by the Secretary of Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Sadly, in our first effort on that effort being asked by President Bush, less than one-third of the President's party were initially willing to take that action. We needed to ensure that we had enough Democratic votes to work with President Bush and the Senate to enact that legislation. And we did. Not long after, in 2009, our economy was in free fall. The American people were struggling, and Congress was divided on how to respond. But despite that challenge, Democrats came together to pass the American Rescue and Recovery Act. That legislation set our economy on a path to recovery, saved and created millions of Americans' jobs, and restored confidence in the American dream. The psychology of consensus also helped Democrats deliver a major victory for the people in 2010, the Affordable Care Act. For all Americans, irrespective of party, access to affordable, quality, health care. Although there were disagreements on the specifics on how best to reform our health care system to make it more accessible and affordable, we all recognize the urgent need to take action. We work together in good faith to secure the votes for that landmark law which made affordable health coverage attainable for 35 million more Americans, banned discriminatory practices, and dramatically slowed the growth of health care costs. Interestingly, the model for that was a bill signed by George Romney, then governor of Massachusetts, now a United States senator representing Utah. Seven years later, consensus among Democrats also proved essential as we defended the Affordable Care Act against the president and congressional Republicans who were determined to repeal it. The psychology of consensus benefits not only our Democratic caucus, but I would say, suggest the entire Congress. We are seeking the psychology of consensus as we speak. If we focus on what unites us as Americans who serve in the people's house, surely we can carry out better the people's work. Surely we will not achieve consensus on every issue. If we search, however, for common ground 
before running to our respective corners. Compromise and progress become more, far more likely. I learned this lesson early, not only as President of the Maryland State Senate, but also working together with Democratic and Republican House colleagues to achieve bipartisan victories. The Americans with Disabilities Act, one of the most consequential pieces of legislation in our lifetimes, shines for me as an example of that working together. In 1990, I joined with Tom Harkin, Bob Dole, Ted Kennedy, Steve Bartlett, a Republican uh, who was the mayor of Dallas after he left here, and others, and then President George H.W. Bush, who signed that law uh, into uh, being. As a result, those with disabilities must now receive reasonable accommodation, have greater access to opportunity, and are treated with greater big dignity. All of us in this House can take credit for that on both sides of the aisle. We achieved that by asking ourselves how we could get to yes on legislation that would benefit literally millions and millions of Americans. We did it again after the 2000 election revealed serious problems with our voting infrastructure. Colleagues from both parties, skilled legislators like Bob Ney, my dear friend, Chris Dodd, my good friend, and still to this day one of my best friends, Roy Blunt, and others sat down together and we ultimately secured the Help America Vote Act of 2002. The psychology of consensus, coming together, working together, being together, making it happen together, made it possible. It has also led many of us to cooperate to promote freedom and human rights around the world. As a former co-chair of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, I've been honored to meet with those who risk everything to promote freedom and democracy in our countries. Democrats and Republicans have worked together successfully to, sort, to support them in that effort and to ensure that America remains a bright beacon to all those living in darkness. As Reagan pointed out, the shining city on the hill. The psychology of consensus is needed to keep that city and that beacon shining. As part of that commitment to democracy and human rights, I've been proud to be a leader of the broad bipartisan coalition supporting the U.S.-Israel relationship and Israel's pursuit of security and peace in that region. That effort exemplifies how to build and sustain consensus in this House. This bipartisan approach must continue. And I will keep working next Congress to ensure that both parties stand firmly with Israel. Recently, the pivotal 117th Congress gave us an example, after example, after example of how this philosophy helps cultivate bipartisanship. Both of our parties ought to pursue that. Frankly, we are seeing an example of that being elusive for our friends on the other side of the aisle as they try to elect a speaker. We came into office facing a cratering economy in 2009 and 2007, a deadly pandemic and a grave threats to American democracy. Halfway through, we also had to respond to the most serious threat to global security since the Second World War. Vladimir Putin's criminal, unjustified, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The margin of our majority was slim, 222 to 213. Many predicted the math would make our efforts to govern <clears throat> unworkable. Two weeks after the election in 2020, the Republican leader told reporters, we, not be, we may, might not be able to schedule the floor, but we are going to run the floor. Our, on our side, our psychology of consensus, however, made this one one of the most productive Congresses in recent history and in which I have served. Not only by striving for consensus among our caucus, 
which proved the naysayers wrong, but by reaching across the aisle to Republicans, to fellow Americans, when we needed their help to deliver results. Indeed, uh, however, we ran the floor because of the psychology of consensus. Coordinating with the Senate and the Biden administration, our House majority enacted major legislation, even against unified Republican opposition. Our members stuck together on very tough votes. The American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act were the result. These laws arrested the economic freefall deployed hundreds of millions of life-saving vaccine doses, reopened businesses and schools, created a historic number of new jobs, and set us up to tackle the climate crisis head on, while enabling American workers and entrepreneurs to make it in America. Much of our success in the 117th Congress, however, resulted from bipartisanship. We encouraged Republican colleagues to ask themselves how they could get to yes. And enough did that we enacted bipartisan infrastructure law, the Chips and Science Act, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the Respect for Marriage Act, and other crucial legislation to our country. We also resoundingly expressed American support for the people of Ukraine by providing critical military and humanitarian aid during their hour of danger. Our hour of danger, the world's hour of danger. Last night, we welcomed and cheered Ukraine's courageous president who guards the front door of freedom, international order, and a peaceful global community based on the rule of law. We must continue to support the Ukrainian people for however long it takes to ensure that they remain democratic, free, and sovereign. John Kennedy, a great hero of mine, an inspiration for my entering politics, said at an uh, inaugural address that goes down in history as one of the greatest, we will pay any price, bear any burden to defend freedom here and around the world. That psychology of consensus made the 117th Congress a success. The same ethos ought to characterize the next Congress as well. And I will work towards that end with my Republican colleagues. Our majority will soon come to an end, or as I believe, a two-year hiatus. The time has come, as President Kennedy said to my generation when we were ready to step up and serve, for the torch to be passed. I will not be in the elected leadership of my party next Congress. I will, however, remain here serving the country and this institution that I love. I will keep urging bipartisanship wherever possible and work to unite Democrats in opposition whenever circumstances demand. I offer Mr. Jeffries, Ms. Clark, and Mr. Aguilar my strongest support, the counsel of my experience, and whatever assistance they may seek. I am excited for them to take the helm. I know they are ready to lead us back to the majority and help our members deliver for the people. My colleagues still will see me on the floor regularly as I speak, albeit more briefly, <laughs> sadly on behalf of the people I proudly represent in Maryland's 5th District. It is because of their support, their encouragement, and their allowance that I have been able to serve in the leadership since 1989 and serve in this body for over four decades. I am so thankful to them and look forward to continuing our work to make Maryland's community safer, stronger, and more prosperous, and to make America safer stronger and more prosperous, and to make our alliance with the rest of the world, freedom-loving peoples, stronger, safer, and more prosperous. We still have much more to do on projects that will benefit our districts and state, and I look forward to returning to the Appropriations Committee as a senior member 
to advance those efforts. My work in the House will continue with the same energy and enthusiasm and dedication as I hope I have de demonstrated over the last 42 years. I also want to thank my Democratic colleagues who have supported me in leadership. I hope that I've kept the faith. I hope that I've done as they would have hoped. I hope that they believe I have represented our Congress, this institution, America, and yes, my party, as they would have expected. And I want to say how proud I have been to serve with the first woman to be Speaker of this House, the indefatigable Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi. Our journey of service together began as interns more than five decades ago after we heeded President Kennedy's call. We sat together in a small office in the Russell Building working for Maryland Senator Daniel Brewster. And we end two decades of partnership in leading the House Democrats, along with our good friend Jim Clyburn, who I've known for 50 years. I salute Speaker Pelosi and her trailblazing tenure. We, my colleagues, have had the great privilege of serving with two historic members of this House, John Lewis and Nancy Pelosi. Throughout my years in House leadership, I've had the honor of employing whom I believe are the first, finest, most capable, and most professional staff on Capitol Hill. Nancy said the same of her staff. America, we, yes, but America is blessed by the extraordinary patriots that serve as staff of this institution and of individual members. They are extraordinarily able people, and they are great patriots. Whether with me for two decades or just a few months, they have displayed unrivaled dedication, ability, and integrity. I thank each and every one of them. They have my gratitude and my deep affection. If I sang the praises individually of each member of my team, my magic minute would turn into a magic day. So I won't do that. Suffice it to say, any praise earned uh, by me belongs equally to them. A number of them were here in the Capitol on January 6, 2021, a day like December 7, 1941, will live as a day of infamy in the history of this nation. They were housed in a small insular office in my office, terrified by those without and in our hallways who called for the death of the Speaker and of the Vice President of the United States of America. They are an extraordinary group of talented public servants. Notwithstanding that terror, they came back the next way, next day to do America's work. I thank them for who they are and for what they've done. Another group of individuals who I've come to know well and who have been at my side deserve recognition. The men and women of the U.S. Capitol Police who have served on my protective detail are among the finest law enforcement professionals in our country. They are my friends. They are part of my family. I will love them always. I've been privileged to get to know them and their families. They are dear, dear friends and, like so many, are great patriots. They are part of a department that has faced enormous strains over the past two years. We must never waver in our support for the U.S. Capitol Police officers who every day protect all who work in and visit this Capitol complex. They are the frontline defenders of our legislative branch. They are frontline defenders of our great democracy. We owe them more than gratitude. We owe them support. Most of all, I want to thank my family, my wife Judy, who died much too soon, my daughters Anne, Susan, and Stephanie, my son-in-law Lauren, my grandchildren Judy, James, and Alexa, 
along with Judy's husband, Chris Gray. They are the parents of my four great-grandchildren, Ava, Braden, Brooklyn, and Savannah. Your love and support have sustained me throughout these years. I hope the lessons of my time in leadership and the victories we achieved together, Republicans and Democrats, members of Congress, 435 people sent here by their neighbors and friends to represent them on issues directly affecting them, their families, and their country. I hope that those lessons achieved together under our Democratic majority will guide the House in meeting the challenges still ahead. The psychology of consensus provides us with a blueprint for success. We in this House, after all, all Americans, all Americans whose common heritage should drive us to a common purpose. In two weeks, there will be a new majority. It will be, like ours, a very narrow one. Indeed, the same margin we have had, 222 to 213. The challenge it poses to both our parties and to each of us, and to the next speaker, majority leader, and majority whip, is all too familiar. Democrats overcame it through the psychology of consensus. All of us, all 435 of us, ought to overcome it with that same kind of psychology. One nation, under God, indivisible. Guided by a dynamic new leadership team of shared vision and experience, House Democrats will approach our brief time in the minority the same way, ready to continue standing up for our principles, for our ideals, and for America with a united front. Hopefully not just a partisan united front, but a united front, indivisible. Republicans would be wise, I think, to take the same approach and seek common ground with Democrats. Did we do it often enough? Maybe not. Did we do it successfully? Not always. But together, we must achieve consensus. Democrats may not schedule the floor next year, but I hope that the successful approach we model will continue to run the floor. Madam Speaker, as we close this 117th Congress, let us look ahead with determination and dedication to the cause that brought each of us to this capital, to serve our constituents, our communities, and our country, to preserve and defend our Constitution and our democracy, to keep faith with those who protect our nation and the allies who stand alongside us, to represent the American people, to affect their will, to reflect their generous spirit and deep sense of justice to the best of our ability. In short, to work together to create a more perfect union. With great reluctance and even greater hesitation for this special privilege I am about to lose, <laughs> though with great hope that in the future I'll at least be able to talk, but for all your sakes, not as long. I yield back the balance of my time. back for what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Neal, seek recognition?